Hello and welcome to Season 2 of the Corner 3 on Pittsburgh Sports Live. Good to be back, ready for another exciting college and pro basketball season just around the corner. I'm Cale Berger, back with you, and pleased to be joined now by my all-new co-host, Chris Mueller. Chris, thank you for joining me and excited to be doing this together. Yeah, of course. It's going to be a good year. There's a lot of uh, fun stuff coming up. I know we got a lot of of things planned and then you know the season you know, three weeks away in terms of college basketball NBA starting next Tuesday next week uh, so it's sure to be a good ride definitely and as always we're gonna break it all down here in the corner three we're gonna have that local focus as we had last year we're also gonna uh, satisfy the NBA cravings of uh, NBA <laughs> fans here in Pittsburgh as we always do that's looking to be a really exciting year in the NBA with all the dynamic duos and everything around but uh, as we start off, we want to do our first show. Is going to be our pit basketball preview, and we're going to kind of forecast the season for the Panthers. We're going to take a look back at what we think, you know, went right last year, what went wrong, what they need to improve on, and take a look at some of those newcomers and try and take a look at, you know, right. w what is this second season under Jeff Cable going to look like? Yeah, exactly. And you know, you have the three sophomores that. Uh, are going to be looking to take the next step after their first year of ACC basketball. Xavier Johnson, Trey McGow McGowan's, and uh, Audis Tony. Can they avoid the sophomore slump that you know so many players deal with? Can they improve upon the things that they need to improve upon based off year one, and uh, you know kind of step into leadership roles? Uh, I think you know Jeff Cable has liked what he saw in the off season with that Italy trip and kind of how they've uh, really you know gelled with this new team. But it, yeah. it still remains to be seen once players get out on the court and the ball, you know, and tip off. So you look at the Panthers in last year, 14-19 and 19 in Jeff Cable's first season at the helm uh, for the Pitt basketball program, 3-15 and 15 in the conference, which doesn't look great, but it was certainly an improvement of, over the year before in the final year of uh, Kevin Stallings. <laughs> you look back and there were some big wins. There was the Florida State victory. Uh, there was the Louisville victory. Yeah. And some really bright spots for this team overall. They nearly knocked off Iowa in the Big Ten ACC Challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of things to like, but what it really came down to is it was still a young team. Um, it was a team that had some major deficiencies and things they had to improve on. But uh, overall, I, I would say it was a, it was a fine first year uh, in Jeff Capel's in yeah. his first season. First off, I think... You know, they need to correct that 0-11 mark on the road. Yes, uh, you know, you need that's the to, biggest thing. You need to be able to win uh, road games, especially in the ACC, where it's going to be a tough place to play no matter where you're going. But I think that's kind of common with the young team is you're not you know, going to play the same as you play the Pete in terms of that. So I, I think that's, you know, a step that they need to take. And then, yeah, as I said, the, the sophomores, and, and how are they really going to get it, you know, in mix with some of the new players they have is Terrell Brown. Can he take a step forward? That's someone Jeff Capel mentioned uh, at ACC Media Day, who he's looking to see big things from and kind of you know anchor down low. When when your six ten guy isn't your leading rebounder, you know you're, you're certainly a problem. On the team, that's certainly a, a problem. That's an issue. Um, so you know I think that's key. But overall, it's really and it, it's a mindset thing. They were in a lot of close games last year. Um, you know, you need to be able to pull those out. You, yeah. You know, I think in 13 of their conference games, but at the last media timeout, it, they were in one possession ball games. So you need to be able to win those. Yeah, and, and you look back at last season, and, and like you said, the bright spots were clearly Xavier Johnson and Trey McGowan's, the freshmen that came in, the first two big-time uh, freshman recruits of Jeff Capel. And right. those guys showed out. Xavier Johnson was certainly, uh, I think, more consistent uh, then Trey McGowan's was. He ended up being 11th in the ACC in scoring. Uh, he was one of the top freshmen in the ACC in a year where, that saw, you know, R.J. Barrett, Cam Reddish, Zion Williamson, some of the best freshmen we've seen in, in, in the ACC in quite some time. Yeah. Uh, he was right up there with those guys as one of the best in the conference. Trey McGowan's, he really had his bright spots. You know, he had multiple 30-point games, especially in Pitt's big wins in the ACC, the, FS, the Florida State game. The Louisville game, he really showed out in those contests. Um, but other games, and it, it seemed like he kind of hit that freshman wall that everyone kind of talks about as the season went on. And yeah. you know that that's what you kind of expect. You know, not a knock on Trey McGowan's, but it's something that as the season goes on, as ab adjusting to the, the rigorous college basketball schedule, playing against the talent of the ACC. It was something that inevitably, inevitably was going to happen. You also take into account that he's a guy who technically should have been a senior in high school last year. Yeah. And he's a guy that reclassified to come and play last season for Jeff Capel. And, you know, 
as, as good of a sign as that is, is a, how good of a basketball player he is, because you obviously have to be a good player, a talented player, and a smart player to be able to leave high school early. Yeah. You also, you know, you're being thrown into the fire a little bit when, you know, maybe you're not as ready as maybe you would have liked to have been going into ACC action. Yeah, and when you're thrown into the fire and you still average uh, 11, 11 a game and shoot 41%, you're doing the right things. I think it comes down to a mental a mental standpoint, really. I, I know he'd get down on himself kind of when he was struggling and he was in yeah. the slumps and, and get it inside his own head a little <clears> bit. So can you really have the mental fortitude to block things out, to go one game at a time as much as it is a cliche, but just know that a bad game isn't going to ruin your season? and kind of consistency and get from a consistent day-to-day approach, I think that'll help him. And then Xavier Johnson, I mean, he's the in the ACC, he's the third highest returning scorer that they yeah, have. Like, exactly. You know, he's coming back in. I think he's really poised for a step forward, um, especially, I mean, you know, Pitt's going to need to find some outside shooting now, you know, replacing Gerald Wilson frame. I think in order to have Xavier and have Trey be able to create space, yeah. they're going to need – you know, that kind of outside shooting. We, we don't know where it's going to come from. It could come from, uh, you know, Ryan Murphy, the transfer, but we don't really know yet. And that's the thing is we look at the guys that are returning for Pitt. We talked about Johnson and McGowan's, but you have Audis Tony, who, you know, he was the team's leading rebounder last year, 179 rebounds on the year to lead the team. Terrell Brown, who – Terrell Brown's a guy who – Probably would have benefited most from redshirting his first year, mm-hmm. but he was thrown into a situation where he had to play. Clearly, a team that was depleted uh, under yeah. under Kevin Stallings. He was a guy who had to come in and play right away when he probably could have benefited from just sitting out a year and right. getting bigger, getting his body right. But he's a guy who's turned into a very good shot blocker. I think one of the best in the ACC, if we're being honest. Um, you know, the one the only kind of deficiencies that he's he's shown are you know his ability to score the basketball. His uh, ability to handle the basketball in terms of you know catching passes, he, he's definitely something that he said he's worked on this summer, uh, and the other players have said uh, certainly Xavier Johnson and Trey McGowan's both said this is that he's worked on his hands this summer. Yeah. You know, you look at many times last year for for uh, Terrell Brown was you know he set a great screen at the at the top of the at the top of the key. He'd roll to the basket and a great pass from Xavier Johnson that would just bounce off of his hands. <laughs> I you saw know? that as freshman year too. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. you know and, and that's something that, you know, maybe sometimes Xavier Johnson throws him a pass he's not ready for here and there. Uh, but also it, it's a matter of you gotta take advantage of those opportunities. He's gonna yeah. get you the ball in a favorable situation. And that's something they've said that over the off season something he's really improved on. And I, I, I think in addition to being more physical down low, improving his rebounding numbers, I think Terrell Brown really needs to add some more on the offensive end. I'm not saying he needs to go be a guy who needs to go out and you know average 15 points a game or or you know get a three point shot that consistently falls, yeah. but I'm saying you know he's a guy that needs to maybe give them eight to ten points a night uh, consistently on you know lobs from uh, off pick and rolls, um, you know second off chance points. Yes, second yeah. chance points. You know. Just stuff like that where he can just add them an, an additional option. And, you know, that was kind of the thing last year as well where, you know, it was really Xavier Johnson, Trey McGowan's, and Jerry Wilson frame. Right. Really Johnson and Wilson frame. And it was kind of a, a, a question mark every night to see who would be that third guy that would step up. If they could consistently get 8 to 10 points from Terrell Brown every night, that's less pressure on the, the top guys to carry the entire workload and makes it easy for other guys to step up and they don't have to contribute as much as well. Yeah, and I think, I mean, you just look at him, he's noticeably bigger. I know that's another he is. thing he that is. Uh, Jeff Capel, you know, stressed that he focused on in the offseason was just getting his body right, his nutrition. I mean, I remember covering him freshman year and he was rail thin and he's getting pushed he around was. on the block. You're yeah. not going to really be able to do much, especially offensively, if, if you're um, a little bit undersized despite your height. And, and yeah, he's always had those defensive instincts he's always you know long wingspan be able to you know make a presence on the defensive end but if he can put it together I know maybe a little hook shot maybe agree um, yeah you know, oh, something, yeah something like that so I think but the fact that he is bigger uh will give him a little bit more leverage on the post when he's you know if he's backing down if he's working with his back to the basket or even a front so I think that'll help too yeah. you look at the other returners for the Panthers and there's a lot of guys that really didn't play a lot of minutes uh, last year you know, Curtis Aiken Jr. really didn't play at all. He did not. Play, he didn't play once in the 2018-2019 season. They bring back Kenny Chukwuka, but he's recovering now from a hip surgery that's going to keep him out till, you know, at least late January, pro- probably into February. Mm-hmm. And you know, that's kind of a question mark for Coach Capel's team is when he's going to make it back. You know, Anthony Starzinski off the bench, uh, 
Samson George. I mean, guys that really had no role on last year's team. So it's a lot of new faces once again. But you look at some of those other key losses and, you know, you saw Malik Ellison decided to transfer at the end of the season. Right. Uh, you lose Cameron Davis. He decided to transfer. And Cameron Davis, I think, was one of the better defenders on the team. Yeah. Um, but another guy that I think is going to be really critical that they lost was City, City and Deer because he was that reliable uh, backup point guard that can come in. He was great defensively. He could run the offense. He had great explosiveness. I mean, there were multiple times last year where I thought City and Deer was going to put somebody on a poster let, a, let alone put somebody on the poster, maybe put somebody in the hospital trying to dunk on people last right. year. And he certainly had that explosiveness and, and was an energy guy as well. And he was also a guy that could, you know, being a grad transfer, or, you know, being a guy with that much experience, you know, he was a guy that I think could come in and, you know, especially when Xavier Johnson was going through some, you know, kind of freshman mistakes and stuff, he was a guy that could come in and really quiet things down for this yeah. team. And I think Jeff Capel really enjoyed having that as an option. He is gone now, wasn't able to get that extra year of eligibility. So that's another uh, another kind of key area is who's going to be the backup point guard on this team. Yeah, and it's really – it comes down to there are, uh, you know, several newcomers or is he going to just really increase Trey and uh, Xavier's minutes and kind of go that way? It still remains to be seen. I mean, and, and the thing is about a lot of these newcomers, I mean, they're all unproven. Yeah. I mean, and, and it's still probably still getting worked out uh, in the preseason now too. So we look at the guys that are joining this team, the newcomers. There's a lot of them. There's seven guys joining the team, and we'll kind of focus on the big ones here. But, you know, the first guy that comes to mind, I think, in terms of newcomers has to be uh, Ryan Murphy. He was the number 41 JUCO player uh, coming into this year's class, according to 24-7 Sports. He's a knockdown shooter, uh, a guy that comes from California. And from what I've heard from, uh, from teammates, from guys on campus, from sources around the, you know, the athletic department. Um, I've heard that he is lights out, that he is going to be a knockdown shooter for this team and a guy that is really f- going to fulfill an important role for them by stretching the floor because, you yeah. know, Jerry Wilson frame not only was a guy that could get his own shot and that could could score the basketball, he was a guy that spaced the floor. Right. You know, he was a guy that could knock down a corner three, corner three. Um, he was a guy that, <laughs> exactly, he was a guy that, you know, really gave Johnson and McGowan's more room to operate. Yeah. And the not only is, do you miss his leadership, you miss his impact he had on the floor. Well, you bring in Ryan Murphy, he may not have the size of Jerry Wilson frame, but he certainly is a guy that is just as good as, if not a better shooter than Wilson frame. So that was the big thing for Pitt is not only did they, do they have to replace him, but they also had to add additional shooting. They only had, only had one shooter last year. Yeah. So they bring in Ryan Murphy, and they got some other guys as well that could knock down a three-point shot. Apparently he turned heads on the Italy trip is really where a lot of people saw yeah. that shooting come out. I mean, he averages 18 points a game in, in you know last season in JUCO. So you have to like what he sees. And even if it's like a spot-up shooting thing, yeah. you're not really asking him to, to shoot off ball or anything or you know dribble, make create his own shot just because if not defenses are going to pack the paint and exactly you're, you're not going to have any driving lanes anything like that so um yeah but then again you never know how juco players make that transfer to the next level we saw jared wilson frame did it in his first year he had some great his, his some adjustment pains you know there were times where he shot literally i remember like you know three for 17 from the field yeah. and he really had to clean that up it took a little bit of time so but pitt might not have a little bit of time for him to kind of you know exactly. work out those kinks. So the other guy that I that I look at and I think that's going to add some much needed shooting to this team is Gerald Drumgold Jr. Um, he's the freshman from uh, I believe Indiana. I believe he's from, but I know he's a four star recruit. He was 109th overall player in last year's class according to 24/7 Sports. Um, 6'5", 200 pounds, really good size. He averaged 19.8 points per game in high school last year at 8.2 rebounds. Um, he's a guy coming in who, I think, like I said, you needed not just to replace shooting but to add additional shooting. And he's a guy who's a long, athletic wing who could knock down a three-point shot as well. And I think when you look at Pitt's offense this season, and if I'm trying to look at what might be a potential, um, I guess, a potential starting lineup for this team, mm-hmm. if we look at game one or you know what might be the starting lineup for the entire season if we're kind of – packing it in. I think the start of lineup we're looking at is Johnson, McGowan's, Murphy. So three guards for this team. And then I think we get uh, Drumgold at the four and Terrell Brown at the five. I think yeah. that's that's the, the lineup that I have in my mind right now. It might not necessarily have the size that Pitt would want, and they have a little more 
flexibility there, adding some guys this year in terms of they can go bigger if they want to. Um, but I think that's the best lineup in terms of maximizing what Johnson and McGowan's can do and spreading the floor. Right. So that that's what I'm, I think he's going to come in and, and play right away and, and be a, an impact guy for this team. You know, obviously he's going to have those growing pains still, though, just like yeah. these guys have had every year. But I think he's going to play a really important role. I think it's also his minutes are going to depend on how he plays on the defensive yeah. end because, you know, he may have came in with all these averages uh, scoring, you know, his ability to shoot. But, I mean, oftentimes we see how with freshmen, you know, they may just be all offensive focused. And yeah. Then they're, you know, but they're a liability on the defensive end and that, you know, then coach can't play as much. Um, so and really, without Cam Davis, they're going to need a solid perimeter defender, you know, from a wing. Um, and if he could step in and be that, then yeah, I could see him playing a lot of minutes. Or if not, then it might just be a, a trial by error thing, where you know you're trying a lot of different guys and seeing who uh, you know plays at least the most as a freshman plays at least the most consistently. Well, that's the thing too is you know as much as you do need him to defend, but I think that was an issue that Pitt faced a lot last year was. You know, just trying to find offense and, and trying to score as a team. And I think that, you know, I think Jeff K, they were a good defensive team last year. You know, I think they created turnovers. They did a nice job against some of the better offensive players in the country, especially, you know, you know, you look at that Louisville game and Jordan Wara, who's being picked by men to be the preseason ACC player of the year. He was awful in that pit game uh, against, um, against Louisville last year. So they did a good job on some of those better players in the ACC, but – you know, I think the the bigger problem that came down to is they just there were times where they just couldn't score enough points, mm -hmm. and so I think Jeff Capel going into this year is gonna we would be willing more to sacrifice, um, you willing more to sacrifice defense across the entire starting five to get more offense in there, and that's mm -hmm. where I think guys like Ryan Murphy and Gerald Drumgool, you know, Drumgool I think physically has the tools to be a good defender. Ryan Murphy, you know, yeah, we're not really sure about that that's, yet. That's gonna be an adjustment. Exactly. But I think with I think with the way that Johnson and McGowan's play on defense, Terrell Brown's a shot blocker. I think he's willing to sacrifice a little more on the wings there yeah. to get more offense on the floor. Who do you think, or you know, defensively, if, if you had to rank from top to bottom, who would you say, uh, at least in their starting five in their backcourt, how how is that rank? Well, I th I think the best defender. I think Xavier Johnson's probably the better on-ball defender, but I think Trey McGowan's is right there behind him. Yeah. And then if you're looking at the rest of the starting five, I, I mean, like I said, I think Terrell Brown is, um, I think he's a legitimate shot blocker. He's a force down low when it comes to blocking shots. The only issue with him is that he, he does have a tendency to get pushed around a little bit. Yeah. Um, but I think those are the guys that, I mean, that's how I think that kind of, uh, kind of shakes out there defensively. You look at the other newcomers, though, and this is another guy I want to get to is this Eric Hamilton. 6'9", 250, power forward, transfers in from UNC Greensboro. He did spend two years at Wichita, Wichita State, State early in his career, which is big time. I see anyone yeah. from Wichita State, and yeah. I like that guy already. Turn, yeah, turning heads. But what I saw, what I had heard from a source in the, in the uh, athletic department is that when he came for his, I guess it was his, uh, his visit to Pitt, yeah. and he had a workout with the team, that he apparently, on the first play, he was working out with Terrell Brown. The first time he got the ball in the post, he put his shoulder into Terrell Brown and apparently dunked all over him. Ah. Now, I don't want to knock on Terrell Brown. I don't think it's as much a knock on him as that is that he this guy's a physical presence down low. Yeah. And he might not get the, the starting nod because he might not be the shot blocker Terrell is, but I think that Eric Hamilton brings some necessary toughness and some power to this team. Right. especially on the low block, because that's something, too, is you look at Audis Tony being your leading rebounder last year. Can't happen. Good for him. Yeah. I mean, you you love to see that, right. that, that guy, that a guy that stands 6'6", 210 is your leading rebounder, yeah. who's probably more of a guard than a forward, but um, it doesn't look good for the other guys. And I think that that's something Pitt desperately needed coming into this year and adding to this roster was that they needed some guy with um, – but just some toughness about them, mm -hmm. some muscle. You know, they needed the muscle. It's like right. when you're in, in like the Fast and Furious movies, and you're building your crew, and you know you need the you need the kind of you need the the tech wizard, which might be Xavier Johnson. Yeah. You might need the 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 offensive guy, the weapons guy, and that's Ryan Murphy. You need a muscle. Mm -hmm. You know, you, when you're putting a crew together, you need a muscle, and I think Eric Hamilton's the perfect guy to to come in there and, and provide that. And there's another newcomer in terms of forwards, Kareem Koulibaly. 
Um, I'm pronouncing that right, I believe. Yeah. I believe so, yeah. Yeah, so, and, and he's kind of another raw guy. I actually watched him play a uh, all-star game last off. It was, I think, last March. Um, and he's really raw. But at, at the same time, you know, when you mentioned toughness, I think that was the first thing that really stood out to me in terms of just like a grinder. He's going to, you know, probably come out there and foul. I don't know. It's, it's going to take some time for him to at least stay on the court yeah. um, with defensive instincts. But he's a tough, he's a tough dude. He's 6'9". Um, and really, he's just like a scrapper. So that's another situation where you think you could be using a freshman in that kind of standpoint. And he's, and he's a guy, too, that played on the Senegalese national team this summer, apparently made really good strides there, impressed a lot of people there with his play. Mm-hmm. And it's not only a guy that adds you another big body down low. He's a three-star. He's a consensus three-star guy. Yeah, but yeah. as a guy that can shoot the three, apparently as well. He apparently he can play a stretch four role. We haven't really seen much of him, obviously, but he is a guy that can be, you know, play kind of that stretch four um, role for this team. That I think that if they do wanted to go with a bigger lineup, yeah. maybe he's a guy that steps in at the four there. You know, whoever plays the center, you move Drumgold down to the three. And then you put uh, Kabali in there at the four, and he, you still don't sacrifice that shooting, but you get a little more size out on the floor. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's kind of the things that uh, he's, Jeff Cable's already probably been testing out in practice, but is going to try to work out in his non conference schedule, too. Yeah. You know. So we look now, obviously, the team 14 and 19 last year, 3 and 15 in the conference. We look now to the preseason uh, ACC rankings, the predicted order that the teams are going to finish. And the Panthers are predicted to finish 10th. So right now it's Duke 1, North Carolina 2, Louisville 3, Virginia 4, Florida State 5, NC State 6, Notre Dame 7, Syracuse 8, Miami 9th, then the Panthers, and then Clemson, Georgia Tech, Boston College, Virginia Tech, and Wake Forest. I think 10th in the ACC is exactly where I would put this team. Yeah. And I also think that that's probably exactly where they should be expected to finish, um, considering how this roster's constructed, where they are in terms of this rebuild right now. Right. I think 10 is a, a pretty good spot for this team. I'd even say that the Panthers could maybe finish as close, maybe in best-case scenario, up to 8th. Who would you put them ahead of? I think there's a chance they finish better than Miami. Yeah, I think Miami, those are two games that, that they could win. Yeah, and I'm not sure about Syracuse. Syracuse is, you know, they're trying to figure some things out as well, some guys they lost to the NBA. Yeah. But I, I think that they could be anywhere in that 8-10 to 10 range. Um, but I think 10th is a good place to be, uh, I guess, not necessarily striving for, but a good place to be maybe projected that shows that this rebuild is going uh, in the right direction. It's a lot better than 3-15. and 15. It's a lot <laughs> That's better. for sure. It's a lot better than Kevin Stallings era. Um, and, and But, I mean, I think it's a lot A lot of it's going to depend on health. You know, Pitt's not really in a situation where if one of their key guys goes down, if Terrell Brown goes down, you know, for an extended period of time in the ACC play, yeah. that's going to hurt them. Exactly. Because you know, they just they don't really have the depth that you'd be looking for. Um, so, but if they can stay healthy, I could see them anywhere from 12 to eight. Um, you know, me too. I'm surprised. I mean, you look at some of these schools just from a couple of years ago and, and Clemson, you know, we never talk about, you know, Pitt even being in a close with Clemson a couple of years ago. And now to see them ranked ahead, it's just, it's a testament to, to how this rebuild has really gone on track. It's a complete rebranding. You look at um, anything, I mean, from the team, but from the social media standpoint, everything's yeah. completely different. The facilities, um, as we'll get into later, you know, completely just, you know, the, the new locker room, the, just the way they present themselves, the new logo, obviously. Everything is just kind of in the right direction, and I think it showed uh, with this preseason ranking, just another example. Yeah, and I kind of want to touch on that a little bit here before we go into kind of our predictions for the season and before we look at kind of the schedule and how that lays out for the Panthers. That's something that I've noticed. You know, noticed last year, but you've especially noticed that this off season is there's kind of the return of a a confidence and a swagger to this program. Right. I mean, this is a proud Pitt basketball program that's been you know a top Root five, ringer. yeah, a top yeah, five yeah. ranked at times. Um, you know, that's been to you know the Elite Eight yeah. in the NCAA tournament. I mean, they've had success, especially in the Jamie Dixon era. Yeah. Um, you know, not even looking like. Not even counting, you know, the success they've had way back when. Mm -hmm. um, but this has been a proud pit basketball program, especially over the last 20 years or so. And it certainly went into some dark places in the last five years. But it seems like they have that kind of that swagger and their confidence back. And that's something that I think Jeff Capel's done a really nice job of is 
he's brought back some sense of, you know, that this is a basketball power and this is a, a team right. to be reckoned with. And, you know, not only with the players that he's bringing in, the players that are potentially coming to the Panthers in the 2020 class. Yes. Yeah, the commitments, the players that they're targeting still. I mean, not a, not even that, but just, you know, you look at, you know, the new uniforms, mm -hmm. uh, the redesigned locker room, which is something we'll take a look at in a little bit here, something you noticed this past week. They're being run like an ACC program. They are. It's supposed to be. They are, exactly. You know, that's like a Power 5 program is supposed to be. But the and other that's just the yeah. thing I think they're putting out. There. But the other thing too that you look at is the, how they they flip the court. So now when you're right. on when you're watching the game on TV, it's going to highlight the Oakland Zoo mm -hmm. as opposed to highlighting the random luxury boxes courtside that that's not what pit basketball is about. Out Heather like with uh, that. Exa she, a great decision. You know, just that's mm -hmm. important to mention as well for as much as Jeff Cable has been involved in this Heather like I think has yeah. played I would agree. Um, an integral in, you know, a key role in, in just you know the the change that we've seen. I would agree. So, I mean, that's just another step in, you know, trying to change the the mindset of this program, trying to change the the appearance and the look of this program around the country. I think flipping the court was a great decision. And I will say the court, it, it does look fantastic with the new colors, um, with, you know, just, I, I think they have a different wood on there as well. Mm -hmm. It looks a little different. So, how would you like if they just if they put a cathedral in the in the hardwood, you know, or so, something so like I that? So I there's, there's there's schools that do that now. I mean, especially so that was skyline. yeah that was something that I I was hoping for yeah. that I liked. You know, I liked the idea of putting a cathedral at, at mid court. I think that would have been something really cool. I don't want to say that the court looks bland, but I do want to say that maybe it could it could. Welcome, a little more of a pop there, I guess, is what I'm saying. I um, mean, the colors look great. I think the design is great. Um, I just think that, you know, maybe if they wanted to put in a little extra design in there, like you said, the skyline, right. the cathedral, I, I would not be opposed to it. I think that it would certainly uh, it would certainly look good. But but that's what, what I think is the biggest to take away from Jeff Capel going into his second year right now is how in just one one season he's really changed the perception of this of this program already with without really winning anything yet. Yeah, and you see you see the difference, and then it's just it's amazing to think this is year two. What about year four? What about year five? Yeah. You know how things could be vastly different, especially with a lot of the players he's trying to bring in here. And Absolutely, already has brought in here. Already yeah. has got commits from. So when we look now at the schedule for the Panthers and the change now now back now up to a 20 game ACC conference schedule which certainly is going to be something this team is going to have to navigate weather, through yeah. in weather this season because even a 18 game schedule was not something they took lightly last year but i think the big thing here is you look at the schedule and right off the bat november 6th wednesday it's only it's under 3 weeks away they start off the season with florida state at home that i believe that's an ACC network game um ESPNU. It's saying yeah. it's but saying ESPNU, but I'm pretty sure it's ACC Network. Call Smitty. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Call your local cable provider. <laughs> Demand the ACC Network. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that's a big game right off the bat and a big test for the Panthers. I mean, not only because it's an ACC game. You know, Florida State's going to be gunning for them. But especially it, last year. Exactly, because they yeah. beat them last year. But I think just because this is Florida State, you know, yeah. Leonard Hamilton always has this team ready to play. They always have athletes. They always have size. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to be a really big test for them early on and how they respond because, you know, they kind of caught Florida State off guard last year. You know, Pitt had kind of went up and down through the non-conference slate, um, and then they caught Florida State by surprise. This is first game of the season. Yeah. You know, and, and I don't – and I think it's going to be certainly – Test them, and we're going to see where they stand, you know, going into the season because they're, it's going to be a big test right off the bat. And it's going to just set a standard, I think, with you know, at the peak for the for the regular yeah. season in terms of when you start out the, the season against Niagara or you start out against you know Montana or, or some exactly. school yeah. that really doesn't matter, and you know, you're not getting students engaged. Um, it, it's just a little hard to gain traction, especially if you're losing, you know, some games early on. But if if you got Florida State at home game one and you beat them at, yeah. at home and you kind of show people, hey, we're for real, like this is legit. Yeah. You show then you get more students involved, engaged. Exactly. You get fans coming to the game, and and then you know just more and more momentum builds as you do eventually get to ACC play. So no city game this year for the first time, and it seems like forever. Weren't able to get that scheduled in, especially with the expansion of the ACC schedule. That was something that yeah. they uh, identified as a reason why they weren't able to fit it in. But 
November 12th, third game of the season. They travel to RMU. They make the long trek over to Moon, Bobby and Mo. and they open up the new uh, the new arena at uh, Robert Morris. Yeah, and I think that's just going to be a rocking game. Going to be a really cool atmosphere. <laughs> it's, I'm glad both. You know, just as an alum and as a reporter, I'm glad both of those schools could got kind of get it together. And um, Robert Morris got a decent team too. Yeah, you know, they're they're not going to be. I mean, I I see Pitt winning that game, but I don't think it's going to be a blowout by any means. Not at all. It'll be kind of a good. Um, precursor, just a good you know step for them for Pitt to get going to face like a decent team in a hostile environment. You know, game one that place is going to be sold out. It's going to be packed. It's going to be loud, and you, you probably will have a lot of Pitt fans there too. I mean, oh, I, probably the way they're doing it, it's like a season ticket thing. Um, but as soon as it comes out, I think it's gonna. Or once they're available, if they aren't already, it's going to sell out. So I, I think that's going to be a really interesting test to start the year for the Panthers because you know, like you said, Robert Morris is a good team. And yeah, they're returning a lot. They got some good guys. A good coach in, in Andy yeah, Tool. I mean, this is not a um, – it, it's not a team to be taken lightly. Pitt should win. But I also think that it is going to be, you know, uh, uh, high energy. It's going to be high pressure because it is the opening of that new arena. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's going to be good for Pitt to have that test early on, especially with some of those new guys they're working in. Uh, it is going to be their first true road game, even yeah. though it's only you know 20 miles away or something like that. Right. But I do think it's going to be good for them to get that early on, especially with the next game on the schedule, yeah, the going, backyard brawl at exactly. home. Exactly, going into the backyard brawl, going into face Huggins. Um, I mean, yeah, you couldn't really ask for a better rivalry than that, I think, especially back in the day. Um, and, and that's really going to be a t- their first. I mean, Florida State will be a test, but that's – you know, West Virginia at home is really yeah. going to where we're going to see what this backcourt's made of, especially. Exactly. And then Pitt will be traveling to Fort Myers for the Rocket Mortgage Fort Myers tip off tournament. And I think the first two games of that are going to be played at home. They got a game on November 18th against Monmouth, which is a sneaky. A, a sneaky, difficult test for the Panthers yeah, yeah. because Monmouth is always a team that is on the bubble of the NCAA tournament that is always making noise. They've had upsets over the last five years or so. Now, I'm not sure if Monmouth is the team that it's been over the past few, uh, you know, four or five years, but it certainly will be, it will be a sneaky test for the Panthers. But they'll travel to Fort Myers. They'll take on Kansas State, which is always going to be tough. And so they'll be tested there, and I think that'll be another big game that will serve as kind of a barometer early on in the first month of this season is – how they match up with a team out of the Big 12 in Kansas State that is, you know, a, a con- team that consistently uh, gets to the NCAA tournament that is, yeah, you know, consistently one of the better. has size, usually. That too, I think, that you know, as well. And that's something that's going to test Terrell Brown and, and some of the younger front court players to see if they can do. And, and we'll see if they can, uh, you know, win a couple games down there and then advance. And exactly. Play, you know, with the potential of who they could play, they could possibly play Northwestern, could possibly play Bradley. Um, so... Yeah, I think that's and that's kind of the perfect precursor almost into ACC play. And then the one final game in the non-conference, or not one final game, but another game in the non-conference slate, the first game in December, December 3rd, they take on Rutgers at home in the ACC Big Ten Challenge. I think an easier draw than Pitt's yeah. had in, in recent years. Took on Iowa last year in Iowa City. That certainly was a game that Pitt could have won, unable to pull it out in the end, but a close one for sure. Uh, and this is also kind of the return of Former Pitt star Brandon Knight, who's an assistant coach uh, for the Rutgers Scarlet Knights, that'll be a special he he night. makes his return to yeah. to the Peterson Event Center. I think that'll be an interesting game and a fun game to watch uh, on December third. Yeah, it's just a special night having him back in, in the arena, and and um, by then Pitt should have their you know their rotation solidified. Who's who's playing what you know what kind of minutes you know it, you're ten games in, so you're yeah. really you have an ident- or at least a look at what your identity is going to be. Um, in terms of that, right before Louisville. Exactly. Now they take on, they go travel to Louisville on December sixth. Then they have three more non-conference games. Then they get into the thick of ACC play. And as I look at this ACC schedule, when you look at the games that they get at home, mm-hmm. they have some favorable ones. I mean, you take on Wake Forest at home. That's a win. You get Boston College at home, yeah. Georgia Tech at home, mm-hmm. Clemson. I, I mean, I, there's some favorable games on this schedule. Mm-hmm. The only kind of thing is there's not many marquee matchups I would say outside of North Carolina and Virginia yeah but you look at that road schedule and for a team that did not win a road game all of last year I it's, think this is a gauntlet of a road schedule no, no. you're at North Carolina mm-hmm. you're at Miami you're at Syracuse and Duke in back-to-back games that's three days apart at Syracuse at Duke and that's a lot of traveling that exactly you, you know, not even it's not like you're going at UNC at Duke and you're know, seven miles away from each other you're yeah literally going from up in New York flying down there's a lot that goes into that. And then 
you have Miami at home, and then it's at Notre Dame the week after. So you have about, what, an eight-game stretch where you play Louisville, or no, yeah, yeah. about an eight-game stretch where it's at North Carolina, and then you have Louisville at home, North Carolina once again, but at home. Then you have at Syracuse, at Duke, a game at home against Miami and at Notre Dame. That is a gauntlet of a schedule, and I think that's really going to be a make or break. Yeah, I, I mean, because we don't know how they'll look when it comes to non-conference. I mean, because they had some success in non-conference last year, but I think this is a little tougher of a slate, so they're going to be tested. They're going to be probably beaten up a little bit when they get into the thick of ACC play, and that's like an eight-game schedule or, or stretch there where I think mm-hmm. um, is probably make or break for the season of you know what this team is going to be. It's how they fare through that eight-game stretch there because – it's one of the it's a gauntlet and it's probably one of the most difficult in the conference. Yeah, and it's it's really going to require some growing up, especially on their part. I mean, you see that, and, and these aren't places; these are places that are entirely difficult, you know, yes. to go to and grab a win out of. Yeah, and then when you look at the back end of the uh, conference schedule, it gets a little more favorable for the Panthers. You know, you have Georgia Tech and Clemson at home, you have Virginia at home, obviously not. Yeah. And easy coming the the reigning national champions, but you get them at home. Syracuse at home. You get Syracuse, and then you have at NC State, at Georgia Tech. You've at Virginia Tech in there. Virginia Tech, that's kind of a – we're not sure what the Hokies are this oh, year. So, so yeah. I think that's kind of an easier uh, – not, not that anything's easy in the ACC, but I think that's more of a manageable schedule at the back end. The schedules, yeah, it's like they rewarded them. They, they put them through the gauntlet, and then they kind of let them coast back in. And exactly. If, if they – make it through, you know, well and, and they're doing well, then that's really gonna favor them in terms of seeding. Yeah. You know? And it's and it's and it's even because it's four road, four away for the Panthers to close out the season. Eight game stretch. Um I, I think there's certainly going to be um the, the the eight game stretch prior is going to be when they're going to be tested. I think this is a more manageable, you know, kind of the light at the end of the tunnel when it comes to the season because that is a brutal stretch there in, in the the heart of conference play. Do you see Looking at the schedule, surprise win. If you had to, or yeah. maybe a couple. I mean, you know, well, when I look at marquee matchups, uh, let me let me look at that first because maybe some some matchups that I'm really looking forward to. I'm looking forward to Pitt matching up with North Carolina, and I'm saying that because not that I think the Panthers have a chance of, you know, have a great chance of beating the Tar Heels, but I'm I'm excited to see it of the point guard matchup of Xavier Johnson versus Cole Anthony. Cole Anthony, yeah. obviously, what the number one player yeah. uh, in this coming. Uh, recruiting class, or at least the number one freshman coming in uh, from last year's recruiting class. Uh, I'm excited to see how Xavier Johnson in year, in year two fares against an NBA lottery pick. I mean, a guy who's considered to be one of the top players in all of college basketball coming in this year. I think that's a very intriguing matchup. Yeah, for sure. And especially, I mean, they they played their fair share of lottery picks last year, but in terms of, course. of you yeah. know, one-on-one matchup, it's kind of, you know, we see, we'll at least get a sign, a barometer of the progression exactly. in terms of that yeah. he's made. Yeah, I mean, other games, um, maybe some surprise wins. I think Pitt can get a win over Syracuse. So do I, especially I, I th- on February. I think they, yes, I think they, yes, I think they can. Exactly. They will have just played Virginia. I mean, it's just, yeah, that's it. I think they can beat Syracuse. I think they can get a win over Louisville as well. But the game I'm really looking at, I think the Panthers start off the season with a win against Florida State. Mm-hmm. I really think even though Florida State, you know, is trying to kind of uh, – get revenge, I guess, in a sense, for what the Panthers did last year. I think that the Panthers, the place is going to come out rocking. They're going to they're going to uh, feed off that energy in the Peterson Event Center. And I think that's a game the Panthers could win. Yeah. I mean, I really do. And there's no tape. I mean, there's film from last year, but in terms of the new guys. And, but this is an entirely different team. Game, yeah, and it's exactly. Yeah. And it's game one. You know, it, it, I just, I can see that too. And, and you get the factor of, of that, just the fact that it is the season opener. I mean, these guys are going to be juiced. And exactly. It's going to be, you yeah. know, they're going to want to prove. They're going to want to put out there, put all the work that off season, all that running over the hot metal bridge, all those days of like, you <laughs> yeah. know, of just blood, sweat, and tears, it's finally here. But then again, that can also come back to bite you in terms of being just too overly amped and playing you know, not within within yourself and making you know uh, mistakes. So, Chris, when we look at this schedule now, we've taken a look at the returners, guys they've lost, things they need to improve. Want to take a big picture look now and say, all right, what is this team – what, what is the prediction of this team? What is the forecast for how the Panthers will do? I know I have a number in my head of what I think the Panthers' record will be. 
What yeah. can we can expect for them? What's your season prediction for the Panthers? I'd say in the ACC, eight and twelve is what I'm going with. Okay. On the game schedule. So, um, I mean, where does that stack up with you? Well, for what I have, I have them going. I have them going sixteen and fifteen. Okay. Overall. Yeah. And then when it comes to the ACC, I have them going six and fourteen. And that would be the first. Uh, above 500 finish since 2015. Exactly. They were to do that. So I have them. Be, I have them going over 500, but I still think that they are going to have trouble in the ACC as it's the best conference in college basketball. I mean, this isn't a knock on Pitt as much as it is a referendum on the ACC as a whole. Yeah. I mean, it is clearly the best conference in college basketball, and that's not something to be taken lightly. Right. And I think that this is a team that, as good as the pieces are, and as good as individual players they might have, and Xavier. Uh, Johnson, yeah. Trey McGowan's, and you know some of the guys they've added. I still think that they're probably yeah. not up to snuff with some of the other elite teams in the ACC. But I do think they improve on a three and fifteen uh, campaign last year because because of their. I don't think you know. I don't see the. I could see that happening yeah. easily. I just with their depth, their a little bit lack of depth. I would go more like you know fourteen, seventeen, thirteen, and eighteen, and then. But I do I could see them coming together in the ACC and doing an eight and twelve mark there. Just just but at the same time, it, I mean, it remains to be seen. They could take a step forward and and you know get plus five hundred. But yeah, I mean that's the thing we don't know. And then one other guy that I want to touch on that we really we seem to have to skipped out on here is Justin Champagne, and he's a freshman coming in who it was something that. Coach Capel had said just a few weeks ago that he was a guy. Yeah, he he had said a few weeks ago that he was a guy who had suffered an injury, that was probably going to miss time this year, uh, that they weren't sure what the injury was. Well, they had their blue and gold madness at the the Peterson Events Center last Friday night, and the guy was dunking. (laughs) So I, so I'm really unsure of what. I don't think he's out for the season. I mean, yeah, clearly the. He he was like, I know he was at. He was asked that. You know, could Justin be out for the season? He said he could be. Yeah, he he, he, he was really he, he cryptic wasn't. and didn't know what it was going to be. Yeah. But clearly they got some very good news because right. the guy was putting slam dunks down uh, on Friday night. So I guess that's good news for the Panthers. That's just another body, another athletic wing. But that's the thing you look at this team now, and they got a lot of guys on the wing. And offensively, he, I feel like he could really make it. Exactly. You know, slashing, slashing wing, getting to the basket, creating his own shot. Exactly. Popping out to Murphy, popping out to Xavier Johnson. You know, Definitely. Kind of thing. So, do you have a bold prediction for the season, Chris? In terms of what? Anything. I think. I I Xavier I, Johnson first team All ACC. Really? Because actually, you you took it right out of my <laughs> right. you, you stole it right out I, of my you, brain. You didn't tell me this. I did not. I swear. Um, over who? Over who? I mean, but I could maybe second like. Here's what I'll say. It's He'll not, make an all. Bold one. He, second he, second or third team. You know. He will make. He will make an All ACC team. Yeah, that's yeah. I agree. First, first team is bold. Just Absolutely, especially with the you know with the talent down at UNC and Duke and the other point and, guards of this country. Yeah, you know, because he, he's competing with Trey Jones. Yeah, he's so competing he really... with Cole Anthony. Yeah, you know, depending on how those guys play, right. they're expected to play very well. Um, but yeah, I think he's a guy that I think will certainly make an All ACC team. Mm-hmm. You know, I think I think the big steps that we're expecting him to take are he's going to be I think he's going to be an improved shooter. I think he's going to be improved decision maker this year, and I think that all kind of factors into him having a, a, a really good sophomore campaign. Mm, what about Trey? I mean, I think he also takes a step forward. I don't think as big of a leap as Xavier does, but in terms, I just think consistency is assist to turnover ratio is going to be a lot better. That's yeah, that's the thing, and I think that he will. He, his other thing was perimeter shooting as well. Yeah, you know, he got hot at times, but he had to improve his outside shot also. Um, so I think that's a big thing for him. And I think the the, the big thing for Trey McGowan's in, in year two is really just staying even keel. You know, not getting too high, not getting too low. We saw how the highs were very high, but the lows were very low for Trey McGowan's in his mm-hmm. freshman year, as, you know, you would expect. But I think that's something that he mentioned at the start of training camp was he's doing a better job of trying to stay even keel, trying to yeah. stay vanilla right in the middle and, you know, not to get too down in the dumps when things aren't going right. Not to get too high when things are going good, but just staying a pretty even keel, I think, is the more important thing for him and just staying level headed throughout the season because there's a lot going on. Mm-hmm. You know, you're in the thick of ACC play, you got classes to go to, you got this, this, and that. You got social media. Everything. Big thing. I think yeah. that he, I think that's a big thing for him is just to stay relaxed, okay. you know, as the season goes on. 
Any other bold predictions for you? Uh, no, I think we're going to get an upset over at least one of the top, I'd say, six perennial uh, I think ACC so as well. Teams. I think the, I think this one, one isn't, you know, in, in, especially when you've got 20 ACC games, there's bound to happen. But, you know, I could see, I could see that happening for sure. I would agree. Well, it's time for our new segment, our Tweet of the Week, and we have some gems this week. Mm-hmm. Chris, we're going to start off with yours. Yeah. Uh, your Tweet of the Week is something we alluded to earlier, but the Pitt Basketball Twitter account put out their, I guess their, a, a little a little hype uh, tweet about some of their new digs. Their new, they, their yeah, new digs. new digs is what it's titled. Bring it up there. Exactly. They're playing 2K. Literally, if you if you go and on their account, you watch the video. They're playing 2K. They got I think like a pool table or and couches. Like yeah. So this is like you a see s- the, the reaction on the players' faces. They're oh all yeah. Just like oh my god. Yeah. So this like is with the MacBooks. Th- well, that's the other thing, thing I was going to mention. This so this is the new. Uh, if you can get a good view of it, there some of the new uh, features of their new players' lounge, the new you know hangout area in the Pete because it's all about. It's all about putting in the work, but also kicking back, being relaxed, a place to do homework, a place to just hang out. Clearly, and recruiting, ex- and recruiting as well. Recruiting, you know, when the prospects see that. Because that's <clears throat> hap- that's going on everywhere. Did you see Duke's recently? Duke just yeah. released their. So, you know, you got to kind of keep a competitive, you know, keep on that same standard as some of these other ACC schools. This is a way you do it, and, and especially just seeing the players' reactions too. Exactly. So I, I think that'll be, and, and that was something that you mentioned was that, the, the MacBooks, that was something that Jeff Capel, uh, they announced uh, a few weeks ago, was that every player on the team got a MacBook Pro, a laptop right. to do their homework on. Yep. You know, and, and I think that that's something that it, it is very cool. He said very blatantly, this is for homework, <laughs> is to get your work done. Don't lose it. I'm not sh- don't <laughs> lose it either. I'm not sure how much work they're going to get done with it. Um, but uh, it certainly was, I think, a good, a cool gesture by this team, uh, yeah. by Coach Cable, by the program, by the athletic department. Another to rebranding take... thing that's just happening. Exactly. It's yeah. another – it's why Jeff Cable is part of why he's such a great recruiter is because, you know, he these knows are the what things. It, he knows what attracts. To, you know, exactly. He knows what kids like, 17, 18, 19-year-old kids, what – kind of things they're going to see on Twitter and be like, hey, I want to go there. I want to play for that coach. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. And when we look at my tweet of the week. This my tw- a little more. Tweet of the week. It's a little more there. fun. And <laughs> it was an all-college basketball show, but it's a little bit of NBA flair. That and that tweet. is, look at this tweet from Whitney Medworth on Twitter. It was, I was sent promo photos for Boban's big blankets. And they did not disappoint. Boban Marjanovic, obviously a massive human being. Former 76er. I'm very. Uh, Tobias, is, Tobias Harris is best friend. Yeah, I'm very saddened by the fact that Toby and Bobby is not going to be a, a duo anymore. Tier, tier. But this is, I think, one of the cooler. Um, it's one of the funnier images I've seen. It, it warms your heart, doesn't it? Yeah. Just like the blanket warms Bobon's massive frame. <laughs> this image of him smiling. I know. Covered in a huge blanket. I saw that ad. Last week, and I literally sent it to I think one of my friends' group chats, and I was just like, "Hey guys, in case you're having a bad day, here's Bobon <laughs> wrapped in a, in a blanket." I, I want one of these for Christmas. Hey. So, Chris, if you're you getting, if you're, you getting me, if you're getting if you're getting me if you're getting me a Christmas present, Chris, <laughs> this is what I want. Right, I want a Bobon Marjanovic uh, blanket because that that certainly has warmed my heart. And uh, you hear that, Alan? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully, our buddy Alan Saunders will take care of us. Uh, this uh, holiday season. But uh, that'll do it for us here on our Pitt Basketball Preview Show. We'd love to hear your predictions for the season, maybe your your, uh, prediction of how the record might turn out, your hot takes, your bold predictions of what might happen this season. Uh, Certainly want to hear that. You can tweet me at Kale underscore Berger. You can tweet Chris at by Chris Chris Mueller. Mueller. Yeah, exactly. Um, But we're back here, season two of the Corner Three. Happy to have Chris alongside with me as my new co-host. Looking yeah. forward to it. It's going to be a lot of NBA, a lot of Pitt, a lot of Duke, a lot of Robert or Duquesne, not Duke, <laughs> uh, a lot of Duquesne, a lot of Robert Morris. It's going to be a lot of everything. Uh, and our next show is going to be our NBA preview show. I'm excited to get looking into that. Yeah, stay tuned next week. It's coming. It's going to be an exciting episode, and uh, we're going to take a look at everything NBA, all the duos. 
how the complete landscape of the league has been reshaped. Right. And it was a fun summer as well. It uh, was. In the first part of the summer. It's not as been as much fun no, <laughs> over the I'm, last I'm month. I'm ready for the China talk to just go away. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, I'm excited for the season, and it kicks yeah. off next Tuesday. So you'll see a uh, new episode on Tuesday um, of the Corner 3, and that'll be our NBA preview. But for Chris Mueller, I'm Kale Berger. We're glad to be back here for Season 2 of the Corner 3 on Pittsburgh Sports Live.